All right, we're going to talk today about what is a Bible believer. Uh, we call our church here, we call it Bible Believers Fellowship. And uh, so we're going to define what a Bible believer is. Turn first to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 1. Okay, we read, For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. But even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as ye know, at Philippi, we were bold in our gospel, or in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. You'll notice that if you go any kind of street ministry, door to door, or handing out tracts or whatever, it's always going to be with much contention. <laughs> um, verse 3, For our exhortation was not of deceit nor of uncleanness nor in guile, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. Now the first qualification that you need to meet if you want to be a Bible believer is, you can't have a desire to please men. Your desire has has to be that you want to please God. Okay? If you are a man pleaser, you cannot be a Bible believer. I can tell you that. Why? Well, right there it says in uh, verse 2 about the gospel of God being preached with much contention. You're not going to please man when you preach the gospel of Jesus Christ from a King James Bible. It isn't going to happen. So if you care about what people think of you and you're concerned about what people think, just quit. You're not going to be a Bible believer. I can guarantee you that. All right, turn to Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, verses 10 through 12. We're going to see this thing again of not being a man pleaser. Galatians chapter 1, verse 10. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay, and we're going to see this as we go through this study. There are two ways to look at the Bible. The one way is that it came from God. The other way is that it came from man. And if you're a Bible believer, you believe it came from God. And there are two basic groups here. You have Bible believers and you have Bible perverters. Okay? If you're a Bible perverter, you'll look at the Bible as a man-made book. You won't look at it as God's book. A Bible believer will. But you see there again, you can't please man and God. It's impossible isn't going to happen. James 4.4, 4, you should know this one by heart. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now, if you can get that thing in your mind and get it fixed in your mind, that if somebody is a friend of the world, they're not right with God, period. And you have... Uh, I have one of the books in my collection. I, I have a lot of books that are just for documentation. And one of them is Billy Graham, uh, God's Ambassador. And it's this big, big, real big book, you know, and it has Billy Graham. Here he is meeting with this president. Here he is meeting with this ambassador and everything else. He's a friend of the world. All these people love him and, and oh, we just love Billy Graham. Bill Clinton, you know, Al Gore. They're all good buddies with Billy Graham. And then you have Billy Graham going over to Russia and basically turning in house church Christians to the KGB over there. And he did the same thing in China. Billy Graham is not, I don't, I believe he's a false prophet and a very, he's a very wicked man, very evil man. And uh, you can get uh, Kathy Burns, Dr. Kathy Burns' book, Billy Graham and His Friends, and you'll see all the documentation there. Just incredible. The connections that that guy has. He's not, He's not a, a friend of God. He's a friend of the world. Okay. James 4.4, 4, if you know that thing, 
it'll save you a lot of trouble. Anyhow, we're going to go next to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. We have this on our website, uh, kjvbbf.com. This is a very another very important verse. And this unlocks another key to the thing of being a Bible believer. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 says, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, now look at the last line, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. You have people saying, I can't understand the King James Bible. It's too archaic. It's this... Elizabethan English and all this stuff. That's nonsense. There are, I, I can't say I understand everything because, you know, the Lord hasn't revealed everything to me. But the more you study this book and when you start to believe that it is God's Word, the Lord will unlock it and the Holy Spirit will show it. This is what this means. That's what this means. Look at that. That verse refers back to this one here in the Old Testament and this one here goes to this one. It's amazing. You know, you can tell that this book is truth, but it only comes when you become a Bible believer, when you believe that this book is of God and not of men. Okay? Very, very important. And if you haven't gotten to that point yet, I mean, I can say I was, I had an NIV for 15 years. And, you know, I was really kind of confused about the issue. But when I began to study this thing, and I've studied it for quite a few years, the Bible version issue, and I'm going to get into a little bit here today, but when I began to study it, I realized I had to come to a point where either this book, the King James Bible, is God's Word, or it isn't. And if it is, well, then I can speak with clarity. I can know that I'm saved. I can tell other people how to get saved. And I can know. I can have assurance. You know, 1 John 5.13, is it? Uh, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have everlasting life. Eternal, Eternal life. See, well, I blew that one. You know what I meant. Yeah. Anyhow, <laughs> the point is, I can speak without being a hypocrite because I believe in the book that I call God's Word. Now, that's the one option. The other option is for me to say, well, this isn't God's Word. It's a poor, it's a, it's a translation. No translation is inspired. All Bibles have errors. And you just go through life just being a liar and a hypocrite. You tell people, I'm saved. I'm saved. I'm a Christian. Well, how do you know? Well, uh, the Bible says so. Was well, the Bible perfect? No. No. Well, then how do you know you're saved? See, it doesn't work. You have to be a hypocrite if you're not a Bible believer. Okay, now let's just... I want to define quickly what the Bible is and where it came from. And I say quickly because you could spend hours on this thing. Uh, the Old Testament... Uh, and This is just a very basic covering here, so... Don't get excited if I leave some facts out. But the Old Testament was basically written in Hebrew and it was finished a couple hundred years before Christ showed up. The New Testament was written in Greek and was finished in the first century, right around 90 AD or so was when the book of Revelation was written. Okay, that was the last book. Now, when these scriptures were written, a lot of times they were letters to different churches, letters to different believers and whatever. And they would make copies of these scriptures. Okay, now the copies that they made, of course, were handwritten. If you would go back to the first century with your King James Bible, or any Bible for that matter, they would look at it as, you know, what is that? I mean, it would be like a mystery to them. Okay, there was never a printed book that people were carrying around in the first century. They would have only had a few pages of scripture. And if you had a church, you know, at the a church at Ephesus or, you know, Corinth or wherever, they might have had copies of the whole Bible, but they would have all been handwritten. Okay? Now, there were two groups of people during the Bible time, and of course these two groups two groups still exist today, and that's the main focus of this message. But these two groups, you had Bible believers and Bible perverters. And even back then, before the Bible was even finished, the perverters were already starting to change it and corrupt it. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17 says, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God speak we in Christ. 
So they were perverting the scriptures before they were even finished. Before John even wrote Revelation, the people back then, they were already starting to corrupt it. And Paul didn't say, we're not as a few that corrupt the word of God. He said many. So you'll see this corrupt line continuing on. We'll get into that in a minute. But look at uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Turn over there. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. We're going to see this thing of people perverting the scriptures again. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. But notice verse 2 there, it says, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us. They were actually forging letters and, and trying to deceive the people by making counterfeit scriptures. And you say, well, that, that yeah, that happened back then, but that doesn't happen today, right? <laughs> Wrong. Wrong. People have always had the desire, the lost have always had the desire to replace the King James Bible, to re replace the Word of God. Okay, it's always been there. People can't handle it and they can't destroy it. So then they say, well, I got to change it. I got to corrupt it. I got to counterfeit it. And of course, that definitely goes on today. So you see that there are basically two different types, two different streams of Bibles. You had corrupted scriptures being made there in the first century. And you had the true ones being copied faithfully. Okay, the pure line, basically, if you study the thing out, and again, I can't get into all the details, but Acts chapter 11, verse 26, the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. So you had the true Christians meeting in Antioch, and they would have been making faithful copies of the scriptures. And then you had apostates, people that were lost, and they were corrupting the scriptures and, and forging fake ones basically. And if you study the thing out, a lot of that was going on in Alexandria, Egypt. And today, we have scriptures that can be traced back to Alexandria. They, that is the minority text, less than 1% of the extant Greek manuscripts that we have, and the true text going back to Antioch, the Byzantine or Syrian type of text. Okay, And true Christians down through all of church history For the last almost 2,000 years now, the true Christians have used that Antioch, Byzantine, Syrian type of text. And there are thousands, over 5,000 of those manuscripts which have come forward to today. And it's important to realize, too, that, that it isn't 5,000 New Testaments. It's 5,000 pieces of Scripture. Okay, you might get a page of uh, 1 Thessalonians, you know, chapters 1 and 2. And that's all that's preserved. You know, they find it in an ancient building somewhere or they find it, you know, wherever in a, in a really old church. But the point is they, they take all these different pieces, these different manuscripts, and they combine them together and to form a text. And today those texts are basically the textus receptus, the received text, which is based on the majority of manuscripts. That's the Antioch line. Okay, that's the line used by Bible believers. The other text is most often represented by the Nessel's text. Okay, the Nessel's text is made under the supervision of the Vatican. You can pick up a Nessel's 27th edition. I have a lot of videos on it. Uh, there are some on YouTube, and of course the DVDs I make have it. And it says in the introduction that this is made under the supervision of the Vatican. And you have Cardinal Carlo Martini. He's a Jesuit, you know, a Jesuit cardinal. And he's one of the guys that sits on the team that makes the Nestle's text. And, you know, the new versions are all promoted by the Roman Catholic Church. And the only Bible that they won't promote is the King James Version. And all of these new versions, the uh, New American Standard Version, the NIV, the Revised Standard Version, the English Standard Version, the, all of them, New Living Translation, they are all attempts by the Roman Catholic Church 
to reintroduce this Alexandrian text. And there are Christians out there that think, well, I have a King James Bible, but I can interpret it with this Alexandrian Bible. No, you can't. What you're doing is you're taking the pure line, the, the Antioch line of Bible, the King James Version, and you're trying to interpret it with the corrupt Alexandrian Bible. And it doesn't work. But, but now I want to look at some difference, differences here between Bible believers and Bible perverts. <laughs> because that's what it really comes down to. Um, you know, a better rendering would be, a better translation would be, that's what a Bible believer, that's or a Bible pervert, that's what they will say. Okay? First of all, a Bible believer believes that the scriptures they have in front of them are God's holy words and changing them is a sin. Now, I'm not going to go over all the scriptures, but you can look up, there's a lot of verses in the Bible that talk about, you know, it being a very serious sin to add to or take away from the words of God. And again, I can't get into all this, but you can study the actual writings of these people who make the new versions. And it's all, well, we didn't think this was accurate, and so we thought that it should read this way. The King James translators, 54 of the most intelligent men that have ever lived, uh, they were very careful to get the King James Version as close to Hebrew and Greek as they could. The New Version scholars, they don't even follow the Nestle's text many times. It's just whatever they feel it should read. See, they're Bible perverts. Uh, a Bible pervert, on the other hand, a Bible believer believes that you know the Word of God, the Bible that they have in front of them is God's holy words and changing is a sin. The Bible pervert, on the other hand, believes that the Scriptures are man-made and can be changed by superior minds like their own. You know, And you'll see that all the time. I, I mean, I've read lots and lots of material from these people and they'll say about how that back in the king you know back in 1611 they had limited knowledge and they had you know they were they weren't as intelligent as we are today you'll see that thing and which is ridiculous okay and and they i don't want to get too technical here but they call it naturalistic textual criticism and basically what it is they look at the bible as just another book like Socrates or Aristotle or Plato or or Shakespeare and it's just man-made and you'll hear them talking about you know well you can see Paul's style coming out here and Peter's style is different and they and they never will admit to the fact that it was not Paul or Peter that wrote the Bible certain books in the New Testament there it was holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost yes the Holy Ghost used Peter and Paul and John and others but it was God speaking through them. God wrote down exactly what he wanted to write down. This book is God's word. It's not the writings of Peter and Paul and John and, and others. God wrote through them. Okay, So to change it, you're changing God's words, not Peter or Paul. Number two, a Bible believer uh, wants all Christians to be unified with one book as their final authority. And it's funny because if you're a Bible pervert, and I've had Bible perverts write to me and they say, oh, you, you would think that, you know, do you really believe that there's only one Bible for the English-speaking people? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. More than one is confusion. More than one is contradiction. Of course I believe there's only one Bible. It'd be ridiculous to believe anything else. And they say, well, where was the Bible before the King James Bible? Well, it was all over the place. But the point is, you know... The, a lot of different people had it. The Waldensians had a Bible since the first century, essentially. I mean, they, they had different uh, uh, Bible there. You had a lot of people that had the Bible. But God, many times he'll only use one language. He used one language to write the Old Testament, one language to write the New Testament. I believe he used one language to have the whole Bible come in. Now, does that mean that you can't have the Bible if you're Spanish-speaking or German-speaking? No. No. There are editions of Textus Receptus Bibles available for those people, but I believe God specifically chose the English King James Version. And again, another study. I'm getting off, off my point here. But to say that it's heretical to have one Bible as your final authority is ridiculous. Okay, that's what a Bible pervert would believe. 
what they would believe, basically, as I stated, a Bible believer believes that all Christians should be unified with one book as their final authority. A Bible pervert, on the other hand, wants to rule over other Christians and force believers to submit to the scholars as their final authority, like the Pope. <laughs> you know, why do you think there's so much pedophilia going on right now in the Catholic Church? Because they don't have the Bible as their final authority. If they had, if a Catholic had the Bible as their final authority, they would look and they would say, okay, the words Pope is, Pope is not in here. Monk, nun, Catholic, sacrament, transubstantiation, Eucharist, none of this stuff is in here. I'm out of here. This is ridiculous. I don't want my kids being messed with, with some pervert, you know. But they don't have the Bible as their final authority. They look to their priest as the final authority. So they'll submit to the priest even when their own children are being molested. It's disgusting. But that's the natural result of not believing in the Bible as your final authority and holding men and tradition above the Bible. And, you know, it's not just Catholics. There's a lot of Protestant, quote-unquote, that have that same philosophy. It's the pastor. It's the seminary. It's the Bible college. They're the final authority, the scholars, you know, not the Bible. Uh, let's turn to Revelation chapter 2. You know, there's some scriptures. If you want to do an interesting study, look up some scriptures where that, that say about God thinking that something is an abomination or something that God hates. And you better pay attention to those scriptures. Uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 6. Here you have God speaking to the, the seven churches. And he says here, But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Oh, God doesn't hate anything. God loves everything. Wrong. <laughs> there are some things that God hates. Okay? And there's one of them. Now, what is the deeds of the Nicolaitans? Well, if you study it, a Nicolaitan is somebody who seeks to rule over their fellow man and keep their fellow man down. You know, that's what a Nicolaitan is. And God says that he hates that. You know what God thinks of the Catholic Church with all their system and everything like that? People going up and kissing the, the ring on the hand of the Pope? It's disgusting. And you know what God thinks? Well, according to Revelation 2.6, he hates it. You know what God thinks when a Christian submits to the teachings of somebody who has a Ph.D. or a Th.D. or whatever and doesn't question them and will actually believe their word over the Bible? That guy's a Nicolaitan. You have Catholic popes and you have Protestant popes. <laughs> They're both there. Now look over at uh, verse 15 and 16. Revelation 2, verse 15 and 16. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. That's kind of interesting. The church uh, there, the angel of the church of Ephesus, they hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. But over here, the, the believers in Pergamos, they had the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And God told them that they needed to repent of that. You know, And he said, if you don't, I'm going to fight against you with the sword of my mouth. And you study that thing out sometime. What is the sword of his mouth? It's the word of God. See, the Bible's the standard. All right? Uh, now, number three, a Bible believer has assurance of salvation because it is because of the written record God has given them. I talked about that earlier. First John five thirteen. Uh, I'll just read it again because it's good to remember it. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. You can have confidence that you are saved and that you know how to tell other people to get saved if you're a Bible believer. Okay? Uh, a Bible pervert, on the other hand, is never sure of anything and spends all of their time questioning and searching for truth. <laughs> and you'll see that. I knew a Bible pervert that was a pastor. He had 60,000 books in his collection. 60,000 books. And yet he couldn't come to the simple faith in believing in the book that he preached from. That's phenomenal. And that guy, every sermon, he'd be up there and he'd be preaching.
preaching, you know, quote unquote, preaching from the King James Bible, and he'd correct it. And every time he corrected it, it was with NIV type readings. See, he was a Bible pervert. And, you know, you'd think, well, 60,000 books, he'd be able to come to the truth. No, because he's a pervert, okay? And I don't mean that, you know, sexually. I mean that he's a pervert when it comes to Scripture. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3. And we're going to see how the Bible defines these uh, Bible perverts. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. Let me stop for a second. Do you have the words of our Lord Jesus Christ? Yeah. Yeah. I do. I have the King James Bible. Verse 4, he is proud knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings. Perverse, you see the pervert there? Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. Now one of the claims against King James Bible believers is that we're divisive. Well, the truth is divisive. I'll tell you that. Are we divisive? Yes, we are. Now, not in the sense of we're trying to divide believers. No. What we're trying to do is we're trying to say, a, a King James Bible believer says, hey, we stick by the Word of God. We stand by the Bible. And if your pastor's up there and he spends his whole sermon correcting and attacking the King James Bible, and you go to that pastor and you confront him and say, Hey, what's the deal here? Are you a King James Bible believer or aren't you? And he says, no, I'm not. It's a poor translation. It should be corrected and whatever. And he won't repent of that? Get out of that church. You know, you have no responsibility to be going to a place like that. Why would you sit under the preaching of a hypocrite? Why would you stand sit under the preaching of a man that preaches out of a book that he doesn't even believe in? You know, I'll just tell you a real quick little story here. I I uh, met with a pastor the one time, and he was King James only. You know, that's the only Bible he preached from, but he corrected it all the time. See, there's a difference between being King James only and a King James Bible believer. A lot of Baptist colleges and things, you come out being King James only. You're taught that that's the Bible that, you know, all the great heroes of the faith used, so you should use it too. But don't believe it, because that's heretical. And so this guy, he was sitting there, and he had his King James Bible sitting on the table. And I said to him, is that your Bible right there? And he said, yeah. And I said to him, uh, is that book right there God's Word? And he didn't answer it. And he went off on some other subject, you know, over this way. You know why he didn't answer it? Because he couldn't. You see, if he would have said, yes, it's God's Word, then I would have said, then it must be perfect. Because God can't lie. So if the King James Bible, you say it's God's word, and then you turn around and say it's not perfect, well, then that proves that either God's a liar or that you're more intelligent than God. See, so he couldn't say yes to that, and he couldn't say no, it's not God's word, because if he said that, I would have said, then why do you preach from it? Are you a hypocrite? See, that's the issue. Okay? It's, it gets my blood pressure up. Turn to Second Timothy chapter 3. I'm going to show you one of the, the signs of the last days. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. We're not going to read all of it. We're going to jump down to verse 7, but if you want to read it sometime uh, and make some application to our modern world, you'll see that everything there has come to pass. Uh, verse 7, Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And you'll see that. It, it, it amazes me how many of these men that have four or five earned degrees and yet they don't have enough sense to say I believe in the book that I preach from. They might have a PhD, a THD, a THM, a DD, a BA, whatever, but they aren't a Bible believer. And it's weird because they keep going back to the university for more uh, more titles and things, for more education. 
well, I did more research, I did more study, I took some time off and went and I did... Why? Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. If you believe in the book that you read from, you will be years ahead of any college-educated person out there. Okay? Um, John chapter 17. We'll go there next. John chapter 17, verse 14. John 17, verses 14 through 19. Now, this is very important here. It says, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. You know, if people hated Jesus Christ, what makes you think that you're going to be able to get along with the world? It isn't going to work. Verse 15, I pray not that, they, that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy seminaries are truth. Is that what it says? Yeah. Thy Bible college education is truth. No, it says thy word is truth. Do you have that word today? Well, no, I don't believe any translation is inspired. I don't, I don't you know... And by the way, if you want to hear a good message on that, we have one there um, on on that on our website. You can listen to that in defense of the King James Ber Version being an inspired translation. Uh, but we have the Word of God today. If you're a Bible believer, anyhow, you can believe that. Now, if you're not a Bible believer, well, what assurance do you have of anything? You know, better keep looking for the truth. <laughs> Uh, verse 18, As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that thou, or that they also might be sanctified through the truth. You know what will keep you from getting in trouble? This book, King James Bible. You know what will keep you from getting messed up doctrinally? The book. Oh, well, I can pray about it, and I can I can kind of go with a feeling there. Yeah, like the Mormons. Mm -hmm. like the Mormons. You know, get a burning bosom, or whatever they say. See? I mean, what are you basing your truth on? If it's not based on the King James Bible, you're going to fall for anything. You know? Just incredible. All right. I found my place here. Uh, some things I want to go over quick. Uh, people say, what does the Greek say? You know, what about the Greek? Well, the Greek is the, is where we need to concern ourselves. And I just want to go over some points that you need to consider before you fall for this, what does the Greek say? You know, if you want to think that Greek is superior to English, which it isn't. Uh, number one, all Greek texts are compiled from multiple copies and pages of Scripture. There was never a book on this earth that contained all the original autographs. No book ever existed like that. Okay, when they were quoting Old Testament, Hebrew Old Testament in the New Testament, they were copies of copies of copies. They weren't quoting original autographs. Number two, over 99% of all ancient pages of Greek scriptures line up with the King James Version. The various editions of the Textus Receptus are compilations of these ancient copies. Okay, over 99% line up with the Antioch line, the Syrian line. Number three, most of these manuscripts are later in their date because they came from the Bible-believing crowd, which actually used them to evangelize people. Okay, they, That's one of the attacks on the King James Version, on the Receptus. They'll say, well, they're just late late manuscripts. Well, yeah, because our, the Christians, the line that we come from, if you're saved, we were using them. I mean, how many of you are using a Bible that's 200 years old? You know, I mean, if you have a Bible that's 15 years old, it's probably having trouble. <laughs> I mean, my Bible's not even 10 years old yet, and I already got duct tape on it, you know, here and there. I mean, it's, you know, there's an old statement, a Bible that's falling apart is belong, belongs to somebody who isn't, you know, and there's a lot of truth in that. Uh, number four, the, the minority text from Alexandria is based on less than 1% of the ancient Greek manuscripts. These manuscripts are old because they are from the Bible pervert crowd and were not used. Oh, well, we have Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, Codex B, Codex Aleph. And oh, they're in such goods, 
good condition and everything. Yeah, because they're, they've been held by the Roman Catholic Church. They aren't going to use them to evangelize anybody. Number five, uh, the fifth point to consider on the, on this, the Greek thing. Uh, the later editions of the Nestle's text had to be updated in over 400 places to read like the King James Version Receptus, uh, because ancient papyrus manuscripts were found that contained readings which Vaticanus and Sinaiticus removed. Now that's something a lot of people don't understand either. The later editions of the Nestle's text actually had to be changed in over 400 places to read like the King James Bible. And yet, guess what? The New American Standard and the NIV, which came from earlier editions of the Nestle's text, they didn't update, update their translations. Hmm. You see, there's an agenda there. It isn't that they're looking to be the most accurate to the best and oldest. That's a lie. It's a Roman Catholic agenda to replace the King James Version. That's what that's about. The sixth point. The Greek is absolutely useless to the modern Bible believer who is interested in evangelizing the lost. Greek and Hebrew are the raw materials that God used to forge the English sword of the Spirit. It's not that... it's A King James Bible believer is not saying Greek and Hebrew are evil or something. No. It's just we realize that it's kind of like the raw material that God used to make our English Bible. This is what we can use out on the street. This is what we can write our tracks in. We can't write them in Texas Receptus. We wouldn't get a single person saved. It just wouldn't happen. Number seven, the perfect word of God didn't pass away with the original autographs. Okay, a lot of people try to teach that. They try to teach that the Bible teaches that uh, the word of God is settled in heaven. And so they say that, that, you know, that God kind of raptured the original autographs up when they were done, which is also ridiculous. Uh, but uh, we won't go there for sake of time, but Revelation 6, 9 talks about tribulation saints being killed. They were slain for the word of God. Now, how's that possible if God's perfect word does not exist? See, God's word does exist. And it's lowercase w, by the way. That's another big distinction you got to make in the Bible. Capital W versus lowercase w. And a lot of these apostate Bible perverts will actually talk about the perfect word and they'll capitalize it. See, they're covering up for their sins. Of course, Jesus Christ is perfect. He's the manifest word, the capital W. But they'll, le they'll lead the reader to believe that they're saying the lowercase w word is perfect. Okay, now let's look at one other thing here, and that is the thing of lost versus saved. One other attack that you'll hear a lot on the King James Version is how can we evangelize the lost when the lost can't understand the King James Bible? They'll say, that you know, I know unsaved people and they can't understand the King James Bible, so it's no good. Well, I got to tell you something. The King James Bible was not written for the lost. It was written for saved people. Okay, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12 through 14 says, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Turn back to chapter 1, verse 18. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Okay, let me just read something here very quickly. Um, this is the NIV story by Burton Goddard, one of the creators of the NIV. And I find some of the stuff in here very interesting. He says, <clears throat> uh, talking about one of the 
guys that made the NIV. He says, He reasons that to give one's children the Bible in a language they don't understand and that even adults do not understand is a serious sin. <laughs> so in other words, he's saying it's a sin when the lost can't understand the Bible. And this guy's, you know, PhD, he's a doctor and all this stuff, he's supposed to be this big seminary man and everything. And yet he doesn't even know enough scripture to realize that the lost, the Bible's not written for the lost. The preaching of the cross is foolishness to them that perish. And this guy doesn't even know that. Another quote here, quick. I'll read this. And I love this. It just shows, again, this, this educated man's ignorance of just scripture. They made the NIV and then they actually went to a high school with lost kids in it. And they let them read it. And here's what one of the lost kids said. He said, I think this is much easier to read and understand. You get a lot more out of it than you get out of the Bible. <laughs> good one. That's a good way to promote your NIV. <laughs> you, know? you see, these new versions are easier to understand for the lost because they're written by lost for the lost. Okay? They're not, it's not Holy Spirit inspired like your King James Bible is. But, you know, you get a lot more out of it than you do the Bible. Of course, you know what he was talking about, the King James Bible. Now turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. <clears throat> Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. We're going to see another thing here, another reason why the lost can't understand the Bible. It says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Now do you think God's going to make his word known to that group of people? No. They're dead in trespasses and sins. Verse 1. Oh, but they can't understand the Word of God. Yeah. Yeah, because they're dead spiritually. And you see, <clears throat> when you hear the Gospel, if you're lost and you hear the Gospel and you reject the Gospel, you become a child of disobedience and a child of wrath. Why? Because you have rejected Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you something, that can become a habit after a while. Somebody rejects Jesus Christ, well, I'm not ready. I'm, <clears throat> I'm not, uh, not today, not today. You were just rejected Jesus Christ. That's not a small thing. That isn't a thing where God goes, oh, well, you know, better luck next time. No. You have now basically denied that Jesus Christ is, is you know, all sufficient for your salvation. You're trusting in your own self-righteousness at that point. That's why God's wrath is now on you. And those people right there, God's not going to reveal his word to them. And for Christians, professing Christians, to try to say we need to make Bibles that they can understand, you talk about sin. That's the sin. All right. Um, John chapter 8. <clears throat> now this is a Jesus here that most modern Christians don't know anything about. John chapter 8, verses 43, 43 through 47. And like I said, this the Jesus Christ here in these verses uh, is completely foreign to the mind of modern Christians. Uh, <clears throat> and by the way, he's addressing the educated scholars of his day. You know, the Bible scholars. He says... Why do ye not understand my speech, even because ye cannot hear my word? Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do ye not believe me? Now look at verse 47. He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. 
plain, simple truth coming from the mouth of God manifest in the flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the, that's the way it is, right there. I can't understand the King James Bible. Well, if you're saved, you can understand the King James Bible if you start to believe it. But if you get somebody that's lost, well, I can't understand the King James Bible. Right there's their verses. You know, they're a child of wrath. They're a child of disobedience. So they're not going to understand the King James Bible. And to try to dumb it down so that they can is a sin. <clears throat> now, turn to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs 3 verse 5. And we're going to see now for the saved, what is the key to understanding? Because, you know, when I was using an NIV, I, I started to... I gave it up and I started using the King James Bible and at first it was kind of strange and it kind of read differently and I thought, you know, I'm kind of having a hard time understanding it. So I'm going to show you some of the keys to understanding the Word of God. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Okay, don't lean on your own understanding. Every time you open this book, you should ask the Lord, show me what this means. Pray pray before you read the Bible and ask God to interpret it for you. And if you don't understand something, don't pretend that you do. Okay, Wait on the Lord. It might take Him a couple years to reveal something to you, and many times it's because He's going to show you something in your life. And then He'll apply the Scripture, and you know it'll make sense at that point. And by the way, verse 6 there, it says, In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Now, you don't have to be saved very long to understand that the Christian life, the path that we walk, is never going to be a nice, straight, broad path. It's a narrow, winding little road that goes back, you know, that, that you're going to meet obstacles, there's going to be a lot of up and down, and God will direct those paths. But the NIV, they say, he'll make your path straight. Well, that's a lie. And I'll show you, it's a lie. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 12. Turn there very quick, just a page over or, or so. It says, When thou goest, thy steps shall not be straightened. <laughs> and when thou runnest, thou shalt not stumble. See, the NIV translators, uh, I don't care how many credentials they had, uh, they were, they had no idea what they were talking about. They were very foolish. If they had just gone over another chapter in the King James Bible, they would have seen that their translation translation contradicts Scripture. Okay, now go to Galatians chapter 1. So you have that you shouldn't lean on your own understanding. Galatians chapter 1. We read these verses earlier, but I just want to hit them one, one more time. Galatians 1 verse 11 through 12 says... But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. God will reveal the meaning of Scripture to you. Okay, You don't need to be taught by man, because man is not perfect. God is. Okay, uh, Turn over to verse 15. Galatians 1, verse 15. It says... But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among, among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days." But other, uh, other of the apostles saw I none, save James the Lord's brother. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God I lie not. Afterwards I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and w was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they had, well, I won't continue reading there for sake of time. But the point is, what was Paul doing? Paul was receiving his education, so to speak, by going on missionary journeys, by going out and experiencing the Word of God, putting his faith into practice. It wasn't a vain religion, a, a head knowledge. You know, they there was a, a term back in the old days, 
back in the 1800s, a lot of the British explorers, you had the National Geographic Society, they were sending explorers over to Africa. Who's going to be the first to find the source of the Nile? Who's going to be the first to find Timbuktu? Who's going to be the first to all this stuff? And a lot of times these, these explorers would come back after years. I mean, it'd take them a couple of years to explore things. And they'd come back, you know, with malaria and typhoid fever. And, I mean, sickness, just uh, fighting. I mean, just amazing hardships that these guys would go through. And there would be guys there that never even left London. And they would correct them on things. And the explorers came up with a name. They called them armchair explorers for these great scholarly National Geographic guys. See? In other words, they all they had was book knowledge up here in their heads. They never had application. And see, that's why it's important for young men not to be preachers. Because they don't have much application yet. You're not to be a novice when you're a preacher. It's important to go out and experience some things. You know, if I would have gotten into ministry 10 years ago, I would have made a mess of things. Let me tell you, it would have been bad. <laughs> I made a lot of mistakes. I had to go out and I had to learn things. And I'm still learning. You know, I still don't know everything. Okay? But Paul went through all those different places. And he was beaten for Jesus Christ. He, you know, shipwreck, nakedness, peril, hunger. You know, he went through a lot. So he was able to apply, you know, the word of God. And, it, and when you get, the older you get in the Lord, and the more things you go through, you'll see that the Bible is true. You'll see verses coming to pass right in front of your eyes. You'll be able to prove. You know, another little story I heard the one time, there was a, a preacher that saw this old farm woman sitting in church the one time, and he looked over her shoulder, and she had beside different verses, she had TP. And the preacher said to her, he said, uh, Mrs. Smith or whatever her name was, he said, uh, what's that TP mean? And she said, tested and proved. Yeah. You'll see that. If you're a King James Bible believer, you'll see the word of God coming to pass right before your eyes. You'll see that it's true. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You'll see that. Okay, now go to John sixteen thirteen. John chapter 16, verse 13. And here we have the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> One of the ways that you can tell somebody really truly got saved and the Holy Spirit's in them is John 13, 16, verse 13. It says, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Okay, remember, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You will have a love and an appreciation for this book if you really truly got saved and if the Holy Spirit's in you. All right, James chapter 1. Go back there quick. James chapter 1. And you'll notice too, if you're, if you're new to this ministry, you'll notice that when we do messages, we try to use a lot of Scripture. That's because we understand and confess here that our understanding is deficient. <laughs> and... It's the Bible that we try to, you know, get our truth from. And a lot of times I've seen preachers and they'll stand up there and it's almost like they're having a contest to see how long they can go without actually turning in their Bibles. You know, I mean, I've, I listen and listen to messages where they, they'll quote unquote preach for 45 minutes or an hour and they'll quote one verse of scripture the whole time. The rest of the time it's just talk. And they aren't telling the people, turn here, turn there, turn there. We do a lot of that here. Um, anyhow, James chapter 1, verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. If you don't understand a verse of Scripture, ask God for the interpretation of it. Okay? Paul did not go to the disciples that came before him the apostles he didn't as soon as he got saved he didn't run off to them and teach me teach me you know where's do we have a seminary here at antioch you know no he went out and the lord taught him the lord lord taught him through through you know personal experience he tested and proved 
the Word of God. But there is the key to understanding Scripture. You ask God for the interpretation of it. Okay, now I want to go through some promises. Look over at uh, verse 22 and 25 there. James chapter 1, verses 22 and 25. And here you have some promises for Bible believers. Okay, it says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way in straightway, forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. God will bless what you do if you are staying in the book. Okay, If you stay within the pages of the King James Bible and you do things according to his word, God will bless you. Okay, John chapter 14. John chapter 14, <clears throat> verse 15. Alright, John 14, verse 15 through 18 says, If ye love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. Now, see how the King James Bible just defined what the comforter is there? Even the Spirit of truth. That's one of the ways you see it defining it. Okay, it says, Whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. The Holy Spirit is not available to the lost world. The Bible says there's no peace to the wicked. They don't have the comforter. You do if you're a Christian, and you stay by the word of God. Look at verse 23 quick, it says, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him, and make our abode with him. Look at uh, chapter 15, verse 7. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. You want answers to prayer? Abide in the word of God. And you don't want to know why that's so important? Because if you know the scriptures, you're not going to ask for things that are contrary to God's will. You're going to realize what God wants for you, what God has for you, and you're going to pray accordingly. But if you're not in this book, you're going to pray for all kinds of stupid things, and then you're going to get upset because God doesn't answer your prayers. See? But I just want to make a comment, too, on verse 23. It says, If a man love me, he will keep my words. Don't tell me you love Jesus Christ and then turn around and attack the King James Bible. I'm sorry, you're not going to deceive me that way. Well, I stand for the NIV. I stand for the New American Standard Version. That rotten old King James Bible. You don't love Jesus Christ. Don't give me that. You can't love Jesus Christ and hate the King James Bible. It can't happen. I mean, unless you're totally ignorant. You know, I mean, totally ignorant. But if you, you have these people like James White and many of these other guys that know the Bible version issue, that write against King James Bible believers, and then they turn around and say they love Jesus Christ, that's nonsense. I don't believe that for one second. Okay. Uh, now, let's close this message up here with some warnings for Bible perverts. Okay. If you're a Bible pervert and you've made it this far in the message, then I have some warnings for you. Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, verse 26. Luke 9.26 says, For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and his fathers and of the holy angels. Are you ashamed of the King James Bible? Do you mock it and say, oh, the Elizabethan, archaic English? Jesus Christ is ashamed of you. Proverbs 13.13 Turn back to Proverbs 13.13. 13. This is a very, very serious warning here. 
And I've actually seen this thing come to pass, and I'm going to tell you about that here in just a minute. Proverbs 13.13 13 says, Whoso despiseth, despiseth the word shall be destroyed, but he that feareth the commandment shall be rewarded. You get somebody who despises the King James Bible, God will destroy him. I've seen the practical application of that. That pastor that I referred to earlier that, that wouldn't say that the King James Bible, his Bible was God's word. Within about a month of talking to that guy, his mother died. His son had to be committed to a drug rehab center. And he had a mild heart attack within one month. And it wasn't because I have some kind of superpowers or anything like that. No, it's because he confessed that he did not believe that the book that he preached out of, he confessed that it wasn't God's word. He despised this book. Okay, I talked to another guy, and I said to him, we were talking about the Bible version issue, and he was saying the King James Bible has errors and everything, and I said, okay, can you show me a perfect copy of God's word? And he said, no such book exists. That's what he said to me. Within 24 hours, that man's wife handed him divorce papers. I'm not making it up. You despise this book, you better watch out. This is not just a little issue where you can have your opinion and I can have my opinion. No, this is God's truth. Think about something. What physical connection do we have to God on this earth? The church? Church buildings? No. We have the book. The King James Bible. Do you realize how many, and a lot of people don't know this, there, are, there have been millions, millions of Christians that were tortured to death so we could have this King James Bible. And the church that tortured them, the Roman Catholic Church, they're the ones behind the new versions. So which side are you on? Are you going to be for the side that, that uh, the blood of the martyrs and saints of Jesus Christ had to be shed so that you could have this King James Bible? Or are you going to be for the new versions? which are made by the people that killed the saints and martyrs. See, uh, 2 Peter chapter 3. Just a couple more scriptures here. And then we're done. 2 Peter chapter 3. Verse 16. 2 Peter 3.16 says, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. Changing God's word, which is what the word rest means, changing God's word is not a mark of intelligence. It's a mark of being unlearned and unstable. So don't change God's word. Don't, don't pervert it. 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, uh, verses 4 and 5 says, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. The way you know that you're saved is if you keep God's word. Revelation chapter 22. It's the last place we're going to turn to. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 22. Verses 18 through 21. It says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of this book, of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So there at the very end of the Bible you have the very last warning being against perverting the scriptures. So you're going to have to make a decision. Now that you've listened to this message, you have a decision to make. Are you going to be a Bible believer and line up with the Bible that God uses, the King James Bible? God has used this thing for over 400 years through the lives of believers. Now, are you going to use that one? Or are you going to side with the Roman Catholic Church and use their Bible, which they can't even get it straight? 
they've come out with 200 of them, over 200 of them, and they keep coming out with more and more and more. So you have a decision to make. Bible believer or Bible pervert? And uh, <clears throat> I just want to close here by reading the lyrics to a song. I have some friends online that uh, they have a little bluegrass band there from Kentucky, I think, and they wrote a song called It's Just a Book. And uh, I was going to try to play it, but the recording quality isn't the greatest uh, because it's a live recording and it was somebody out in the crowd with a video camera. So, you know, the speaker doesn't pick it up all that great. But you can see it on YouTube, uh, Seminole String Band. Just look for that. And they have a song called It's Just a Book. And uh, I'll just read the lyrics here very quickly and then we'll finish this up. It says, When I look around and see the blessings of this country, it's plain to see how good the Lord has been. But I hear, but I hear some people say, Put that old black book away. And then I just remind them once again, It's just a book that saved me from damnation. It's just a book that cleansed me from my sin. It's just a book that founded this great nation. And it's our only hope to get her back again. And the King James Bible, by the way, is the only hope for America. Are they going to accept it? No. But it is the only hope. Uh, they don't want God's gift to man because they don't like my King James Bible. They don't care to hear what Jesus Christ has done. They speak with such, such conviction and condemn us, condemn us with such hatred. But just show the book and man just watch him run. It's just a book. Why are you running? It's just a book. Why do you get so mad? It's just a book. Why do you get so nervous? <laughs> it's just a book that knows every thought you've had. If you look, <clears throat> excuse me, if you open up this book into your heart, it takes a look and it shows you exactly what you are. From the pages there within, it points out your every sin. It discerns the thoughts and intents of your heart. It's just a book that showed me full salvation. It's just a book that read my title clear. It's just a book that gave me the victory. It's the Holy Bible that I hold so dear. It's just a book that saved me from damnation. It's just a book that cleansed me from my sin. And it's just a book that founded this great nation. And it's our only hope to get her back again. So that's the song there. And that <clears throat> really kind of sums it up. And you'll see that. If you are a Bible believer, you will see that this King James Bible makes people nervous. So you're going to have to make a decision. Get on one side or the other. That's it. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.